We're now going to take a look at some applications of exponential functions. And as you'll see in many of your science courses, chemistry, physics, there are many, many applications of these exponential functions. So the first application we want to take a look at here is compound interest. So we have a formula down here for compound interest, and it goes like this. If you have P dollars that you invest into an account paying an annual interest rate R that's compounded N times per year, then the balance in your account after T years is given by this formula. So this reads the balance after T years equals your principal P times 1 plus R over N all of that raised to the n times t power. Now let's take a look at a few examples and then we'll come back and prove this formula later on. Now in this example we assume that we start with a thousand dollars at an annual interest rate of 3.4 percent compounded monthly and we want to find the balance in our account after 10 years. So we need to identify the P, the R, the N, and the T so that we can plug everything into this formula. So in this case, the P is $1,000. That's what you start with. The R in this case is going to be, well, we have to be careful. It's not going to be 3.4. It's actually going to be 0.03 three four which is three point four divided by one hundred that's the actual value that we use when we plug a rate into a mathematical formula uh, we want to use this number not the three point four and the reason for that is uh, like this suppose uh, we ask this question suppose you have a hundred fifty dollars and we ask the question what is 5% of that $150? Well, what we would do is we would multiply the 150 times 0 0.05, right? You don't multiply it by 5, you multiply it by 0 0.05, which is 5 over 100, right? And then what you would end up with here would be 7 so 7.5 is 5% 5 of 150. So in this formula, the R is referring to this value here, not the 3.4. The 3.4 is just stated for convenience sake because when you talk about interest rates, most people look at them as a percent rather than their fractional value right here. Okay, so that's our R. Now what is the N and the T? Well, the N, that's the number of compoundings per year. Now, this account is compounded monthly, so the N in this case is going to be 12. And we want to find the balance in our account after 10 years, so the T is going to be 10. Now, let me just explain a little bit about this uh, compounding. Now in this case, our money is compounded monthly. Now, uh, what does that mean? Well, what that means is this. If you start out and you invest, say, P dollars on January 1st, the compounding means this. Come February 1st, the bank is going to evaluate how much money you earned in interest during the month of January. So you will have earned that much in interest. So you take your principal P and you multiply it by R over N. So for example if you're dealing with monthly compounding well that would be a 12 right here. So your interest rate you earned one your interest rate is one twelfth of what it would be during the entire year and now the bank adds this interest back into your account and then so for the month of February until March 1st, so from February 1st to March 1st, you're then earning interest on your principal 
plus interest. So you're earning interest on interest. And then come March 1st, the bank evaluates how much interest you earn. So from on February 1st, you had this much money in your bank account. And then they calculate how much interest you earned on that. And so that would be R over 12. times the amount that you started with, with on February 1st and then this is how much money you have on March 1st and then from March 1st to April 1st you're earning interest on interest on interest so that's what compound interest means you're adding the interest you earned back into your account at specific times and then you're earning interest on that interest into the future so that's what compounding means. So let's finish this problem now. Oh, and by the way, this compounding uh, will make this a little bit clearer when we actually go over the deriv derivation of this formula. So now let's calculate how much money we have, have after 10 years. So our balance after 10 years is going to be we just have to plug everything into the formula. And there you go. You just have to evaluate that on your calculator. Now, I just want to point out one thing. When you evaluate this on your calculator, you must be very careful with the exponent. Obviously, this is 120. But if you typed it in as 12 times 10, you would need parentheses around the 12 times 10 when you can, uh, type it in your calculator. So if you enter this into your calculator, you should enter it at, like this. So that's how it should be entered. Notice we have parentheses around what is in the exponent. If we didn't have parentheses around the exponent here, so if I took them away, what your calculator would do is it would take this number and raise it to the 12th power, like that, and then it would multiply by 10. So it would be like dropping the 10 out of the exponent and just multiplying this quantity times 10 instead of the 10 being in the exponent. So you must be careful to have parentheses around what's in your exponent. And when you evaluate this quantity, you'll find that you get 1,404.27. So during that 10 year period, you earned four hundred four dollars and twenty seven cents in interest and that was over a ten year span at three point four percent interest and now let's take a look at this example let's just redo the previous example but with daily compounding instead of monthly compounding so if for daily compounding your number of compounding periods is going to be 365 instead of 12. So we just need to go back here and change all the 12s to 365. So this would become a 365, 365 times 10, 365 here, 365, and here a 365. And so when we evaluate this quantity, we then get is $1,404.93. And so as you see, there's not much of a difference here. Uh, there's only a difference of about 66 cents over a 10 year period. So obviously the compounding is not that big of a deal. We went from monthly to daily compounding. We only gained about 66 cents over a 10 year period in the amount of interest we earned. So what's obviously much more important is your interest rate. Boosting that from 3.4 up would make a much bigger difference than just increasing the number of compounding periods. Now let's take a look at this example. 
So suppose we invest $1,000 at an interest rate of 3.4%, so same problem, compounded monthly. But now we want to find the amount of time it takes for our money to double. So we want to find the doubling time for this account. So what we're going to set up here is we're going to set up our balance. So our balance So there's our balance after t years. So we started with $1,000. Now we want to find out how long does it take for this to become $2,000. So we simply set this equal to 2000 And now we just have to solve this equation for t. And now dividing the 1000 to the other side, to the side with the 2000, we get that. Now we have to solve this equation for t. So what we need to do is get that 12t out of the exponent. Well, what function gets exponents, pulls exponents down? Well, the natural log function. So we're going to take the natural log of both sides. Notice how I dropped the 12t out of the exponent by properties of the natural logarithm. And now we can solve for this value t right here, just by, by dividing 12 times the natural log underneath the natural log of 2. And we end up with our doubling time, which is 24.2 years. So investing money at 3.4% compounded monthly will take about 20.4 years to double. And note one other thing here for this. Uh, I stated that we invested a thousand dollars. It doesn't matter how much you invest, your doubling time remains unchanged. If I just put a P here for supposing that you invest P dollars, the doubling time would still be the same because we would set up P times and then if we wanted it to double we would set that equal to 2P. Well notice now that the P's cancel here and we end up with the same equation that we had up here to solve for the t. So it doesn't matter the amount of money you invest. The doubling time is always the same. If I only invested one dollar, it would take 20.42 years to get back two dollars. Now here's an interesting problem we're going to look at. We're going to look at what's called continuously compounded interest. Now recall that this is our compound interest formula for an amount P invested at an interest rate R compounded N times per year for T years. Now we might ask, what happens as N goes to infinity, the number of compounding periods? As we saw before, we went from 12 to 365 compounding periods. We looked at that in two different examples and we saw that it really didn't make very much difference even after 10 years of investing. So what does happen as n goes to infinity? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take this formula and we're going to let n approach infinity and we're going to calculate a new formula here and that's going to be our continuously compounded interest formula. So to evaluate this quantity, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of p times 1 plus r over n to the nt, we're going to do this. First of all, notice that we can move the p outside the limit because this does not depend on n at all. So we end up with 
this right here to be outside. So all we really have to do is evaluate this portion right here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a little change of variables. We're going to let the r over n right here, we're going to set that equal to 1 over m. Or more precisely back here, if we let m equal n divided by r, or n is m times r, notice if I move the r over to the other side I get n equals m times r, and this is the same as saying 1 over m equals r over n. Notice this part right here. If I just flip the fraction on each side, I get 1 over m is r over n. Might seem a little bit strange, but just bear with me here. You'll see why we do it like this. So this part right here, the r over n, that's going to become 1 over m. And the n right here, from this part right here, that's going to become m times r. Now notice this also. As n goes to infinity, since n is equal to m times r, or n over r equals m, as n goes to infinity, since the r is a positive number, the m will also go to infinity. Now let's take a look at what's called continuously compounded interest. So if you recall in the previous two examples we did, we first looked at a problem where we had monthly compounding, so the n was 12, the number of compounding periods was 12, and then we increased this from 12 to 365. And we saw that the amount of interest additional interest that we earned over a 10-year period was very small. So now the question is, suppose we increase from 365, that's daily, uh, suppose we compounded every hour or even every second, or we simply let this quantity approach infinity. What happens to our compound interest formula? That's what we're going to take a look at now. So if we start out with our formula for compound interest right here, balance equals p times 1 plus r over n to the nt, we want to see what happens as the n goes to infinity. What do we get back? So we're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of our compound interest formula right here. So this is what we want to try to evaluate and see if we get some type of formula back that we can use. And as we'll see soon, we will. And it's very interesting to note what we get back. So let's start with this. So here we have our limit, n goes to infinity, p times 1 plus r over, r over n to the nt. Notice that we can move the p outside the limit here, because it does not depend on n. So here we've moved it outside. Now we're going to do a little substitution trick. We're going to replace this r over n quantity right here with 1 over m. So we're going to let 1 over m equal r over n. And notice that this is the same as saying, and notice that this is the same as writing n equals m times r. So notice I just moved the n over here, multiplied the m over to this side. So now what we can do is replace the r over n with 1 over m, and the n here will get replaced with m times r. And also notice this. If n is going to infinity, if this quantity right here goes to infinity, then since the m equals n over r, let me write it like this, so this quantity goes to infinity, the m will also go to infinity. Because the r is a positive number, we're assuming r is some positive number. So if this term goes to infinity, the m must also go to infinity. 
So now with all of these substitutions over here, let's see what this limit turns into. So now down here we start with our limit and we're going to do the substitutions and let's see what we get. So recall we replace the r over n with 1 over m, right there it is, and we replace the n with an m times r. So right there that's replaced. Now we're going to do a little algebra trick here. Recall that a to the x times y equals a to the x raised to the y power like that. That's just by properties of exponents. So we're going to write this term right here. Let me put it down here. So we're going to write we're going to treat the m like the x right here and the rt like the y. And so we can write this as like that. And that's exactly what we have right here. Now you'll notice this. The RT does not depend on M at all. But we're looking at the limit as M goes to infinity. So since the RT does not involve M's, we can actually move this limit inside the parenthesis right to here. And what we end up with is this. Now, all we have to do is evaluate this quantity right here the limit as m goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over m raised to the mth power. So what is that going to be? Well what you can do is get your calculator out and plug in some large values for m. And so I have a little table down here and you'll see that these are the values that you get for m. And let's see if we can find out what that quantity is approaching. So here we have various values for m plugged into this formula. And you can verify this on your calculator also. So if I plug 100 in for the m right here, we get back 2.7048138. Then if we plug in 1000, we get this quantity. 10,000, we get this. 100,000, we get this. Do these numbers look familiar? 2.7182 six eight hmm, that looks like it's very close to the number e and in fact that's what's happening as you plug larger and larger values of m into this formula up here you're getting closer and closer to the number e now we're not in a position to prove that yet but that is a fact and we'll actually be able to prove that later on just not right now so what happens is this quantity right here, this limit, is actually E, amazingly. And so we end up with the formula for continuous compounded interest, P times E to the RT power. So in other words, this formula right here, balance as we let N go to infinity, this quantity approaches or becomes, as we let n go to infinity, p times e to the rt. And that's our formula for continuously compounded interest. Now let's take a look at an example with this. And right here is our formula, by the way, stated for us. So if you take p dollars and invest it at an interest rate r, compounded continuously, then the balance in your account after t years is given by p e to the rt. So here's an example. Suppose you invest, same problem as before, suppose you invest a thousand dollars at a rate of 3.4 percent compounded continuously now, find the balance in your account after 10 years and compare that to monthly compounding. So all we have to do is plug everything into this formula. So in this case, our P is 1,000, our R is 
zero three four notice we do not have an n anymore because we let that go to infinity and t is ten so your balance after ten years is going to be one thousand e the point zero three four times ten and you can evaluate that on your calculator and you'll get one thousand four hundred four dollars and ninety five cents rounding to two decimal places so not that big of a deal continuous compounding remember when n was twelve for regular compound interest we obtained then when when we let n be three hundred sixty five for daily compounding we ended up with And now for continuous compounding with n being infinity, we end up with, so really it's only about a two cent difference over 10 years, daily compounding versus continuous compounding. But it's still very interesting to note how this formula turns out here, and that particular limit as m goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over m to the mth power equaling e. And here's one more application of the natural exponential function e to the x. You'll find this in statistics. In particular, one of the most important distributions in statistics is the normal distribution, or many of you may know it as the bell curve. The bell curve is actually defined by the exponential function e to the x and this is the formula down here for it. This is also known as your standard normal distribution. This is the actual formula and down here we have the graph of it and if any of you have had statistics you will immediately recognize this graph as being a normal distribution. So this is the standard normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. You don't need to know that for this course but just in case you had a statistics course the standard normal distribution is given by this equation. Notice it's 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e to the negative x squared over 2. So it's very the the uh, natural, natural exponential function e to the x plays a central role in statistics. And let's take a look at this example down here. Let's find all of the inflection points for our standard normal distribution. So all we have to do is find where the second derivative changes sign for this function. So let's do that. So to find the inflection points we need to take the second derivative. So let's note that the first derivative So there's the first derivative. Notice this negative x came from the derivative of this term right here. I had to use the chain rule. And then our second derivative. Now we're going to now we're going to need to use the product rule on this term. So we're going to have to go negative x times the derivative of this plus e to the negative x squared over 2 times the derivative of x. And what we're going to get is this. And that's what we end up with. Notice where this positive, neg uh, positive x squared came from. When I take negative x times the derivative of this term right here, we're going to get negative x times, right, by the chain rule. This piece right here being the derivative of e to the negative x squared over 2. And then negative x times negative x gives us a positive x. So that's our second derivative. Now we need to find where that is equal to zero. So let's simplify that as this. 
and I'm going to pull out an e to the negative x squared over 2 from both terms here. All right, and that's what we get. And now we need to set this equal to 0, find out where it is 0 or dne. Well, we don't need to worry about the dne. This exists everywhere. We don't need to worry about that. Well, you notice it's equal to 0 when this term is equal to 0, because the stuff out here, this never equals 0. This is just a constant. And if you recall, your exponential function is never zero for any exponent value. Its graph lies completely above the x-axis. So this term is never equal to zero. So all we have to do is worry about where does x squared minus 1 equal zero. Well, obviously, that's equal to zero at x equals plus and minus 1. So now we need to uh, verify that these are going to be the inflection points for the function. So we need to set up our sign pattern for the second derivative. And just verify that the sign of the second derivative changes as we move across these points. And then that will verify that these are inflection points. So if we put negative 1 here, and 1 right here, and then we pick some test points like 0, 2, and negative 2. Well, let's see, if we put 0, let's start with that one. If we put 0 back into the second derivative here, 0 in for the x squared, you're going to get negative 1 times, and this all of this out here is always positive. So you're going to get a positive number times negative 1. That's going to be negative. So your second derivative is negative between negative 1 and 1. We plug 2 in for x. We're going to get 4 minus 1, that's 3, times a positive number. This is always positive, so that's going to be positive. And then if we plug negative 2 in here, we're also going to get back a positive quantity for f double prime. And so there we go. So that does verify that we have a point of inflection at negative 1 and 1, because we have a change in concavity. So, And you can see that from the graph. So right here, we have an inflection point, and right here, we have another one. And yes, it does look like we are concave up here, from negative infinity to negative 1, or concave down from negative 1 to 1, and then concave up again from 1 to infinity. So these are indeed inflection points. And if you wanted to actually find the values for those points, you would just plug negative 1 into your function down here. So that point right there would be negative 1, and f of negative 1 would be Okay, that's f of 1 right here. 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the negative 1 half, whatever that number comes out to be. Notice if I put negative 1 in here for x, that's what I get. And then if we put 1 in here for x, we get the same thing except this is positive 1. So this point right here, that is right there. You can evaluate on your calculator to find out an approximate value for 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e to the negative 1 half if you like. But those are the inflection points for the standard normal distribution. And that concludes our discussion about applications of exponential functions. Just keep in mind there are many, many more applications than just the two that we've looked at here.